This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to talk about the subject of why do Christians suffer. And the first thing is, our example suffered. Look at verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are in all Achaia. So Paul is our example. He said in 1 Corinthians 4.16, Be ye followers of me. And Paul did a lot of suffering. In 2 Corinthians 11.23-28, he gives you an idea of how he suffered. And if he is our example and he suffered, no wonder you see Christians who suffer. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that live all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul said he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And if that's so, then we should follow his footsteps and his brother Timothy, who is also his son in the faith. The Timothy he wrote to in first and second Timothy. But Paul is writing these things to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And that is all the Christians in Corinth and all the saints in Achaia. Corinth is in Achaia. So this letter is addressed to more than just the Corinthians. He's also addressing it to you and me. And we are going to go through suffering just like they did. So if our example suffered, then it makes sense that we will suffer. Also, we suffer because this allows God to show His grace and peace to us. In 2 Corinthians 1, 2, it says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, God allows us to suffer so that He can fully show us grace and peace. In Hebrews four sixteen it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when is it that you or more likely to approach the throne of grace. That's when you're going through some hard times. That's just how it is. When The more we're suffering, the more we, we want to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why God lets us suffer many times, is so that He can show us how, where g- true grace and peace comes from. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9-10, through 10, it says, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's the Apostle Paul that said that as well. So we suffer so God can show His grace. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. And when you go through suffering, He gives you the strength to make it through it. You actually turn out stronger when you're going through afflictions because then you are leaning on the Lord and not on your own strength. You see what I mean? You're leaning on the Lord who's much stronger than you when you're suffering Instead of leaning on yourself. And that is why Paul said, For when I am weak, then am I strong. Because the weaker he gets, the more he's leaning on the Lord. So verse 2 in 2 Corinthians 1. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever suffered for the Lord? If so, then you know when you're suffering for Him, there is this peace that shows us that it's a lot more peaceful than anything the world can give. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So have you ever done something humiliating for the Lord, and you were scared to death right before you did it, and then when you started doing it, a big breeze of peace just swept over you, and all that mattered to you was God and what He thought and not what all the other people think. God will let you go through stuff so He can show you His grace and peace from another world. God will also let a Christian suffer so that God Himself can comfort you. In verse 3 of 2 Corinthians, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. A lot of people 
are confused by the verse because it makes a distinction between the Father and the Son. And that is because you can't comprehend the Godhead, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The verse actually proves the deity of Jesus Christ because when Paul says, Blessed be God, he has to get a little bit more specific on which person of the Godhead that he's referring to. So he says, Blessed be God, even the Father. When he says, even the Father, he's just getting more specific, telling you which person of the Godhead he's referring to. He calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And the Lord will let you suffer so that he can comfort you. When my daughter gets scared or hurt, she runs to me because I'm her father. Just like when, when you get scared or hurt, you run to your father. Psalms 103.13 says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. One time a dog came in the yard, a really big dog, and my daughter freaked out, ran towards me with a terrified look on her face. So sometimes God lets mean dogs run in the yard so that you'll run to him and he can show you comfort. Some Christians won't come to the Father unless a dog's barking at them, chasing them. And that's why he lets them suffer many times or have something bad happen to them. So God allows us to suffer so that he can show us comfort. And also, he allows us to suffer to help others who suffer. In 2 Corinthians 1.4 it says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. If we have been through some things for the Lord's name's sake, then we can help others going through the same things. There are always people having it just like you're having it. 1 Peter 5.9 says, Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. A lot of Christian men and women are suffering as a single person because they can't find a godly person to marry. That is suffering for the Lord's sake. You're not settling for a lost person to marry because you love the Lord and you're, you, you're having that sacrifice and you're suffering for the Lord's sake. And there are thousands of Christians going through that. You just have to pray and you have to get out there and find the person to marry. There are people who don't have any friends because they can't find any Christian to fellowship with. That is suffering for righteousness sake. There are thousands of people going through that very thing. There are people who have been tortured for Christ just today. We haven't gone through that yet here. Most people haven't, but it's coming. And when it does, you'll be able to comfort those who go through it. 2 Corinthians 1.5 says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. It is the sufferings of Christ we are talking about here. All that live godly in Christ. It is the sufferings of Christ we're talking about here. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I've sh I'm sure you've been made fun of or took a stand on righteousness and the truth and been made fun of. But when you're standing up for the truth and people come against you, then the peace blows in. And your consolation, that is your comfort, abounds by Christ. You can be bold in the truth because if God be for us, who can be against us? Now verse 6, 2 Corinthians 1, 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So it is for the consolation and salvation of others that God lets us go through afflictions. When people see us make it through hard times, then they get bold to go through hard times. When they saw Paul in prison for the gospel's sake, it gave them boldness to go to prison for the gospel's sake. Philippians 1.14 says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. When you go through suffering... You can help others who are going through the same thing that you went through. 2 Corinthians 1.7 And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. So their hope is steadfast. It's settled. It is sure and firmly fixed. And Paul knows that if they are partaker of the sufferings, then it is for sure they will be partaker of the consolations which is the comfort. So we go through sufferings 
so that we can help others who suffer. And we suffer so we can trust in God. 2 Corinthians 1.8 says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So when the world is too strong for you, then you realize you can't make it without God. You'll realize that God is your only hope. And Paul says he was pressed out of measure, above strength. I don't understand how a lost person makes it. They're without hope and without God in the world. And I've been in situations where if I didn't have God to call on, I would have just fell over. The atheist says Christians are just weak-minded. I, I agree this world is a lot bigger than me, but God is bigger than the world. And as we've already talked about, Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong. When I'm pressed out of measure above strength, I just let the Lord lift it. Just do your best to live right and do what God says and then let him lift the rest of it. 2 Corinthians 1.9 But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Paul said he had the sentence of death in himself. There are times when you just want to give up and die. Elijah requested that he might die. And I'm sure you've been through times where you just didn't want to live anymore, even after you were saved. Don't trust in yourself, but trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not into thine own understanding. Job thirteen fifteen says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Trust the Lord. God lets you go through some things, so you'll find out that you need to trust in him. 2 Corinthians 1, 10, who, are, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So notice that it says, who delivered us, doth deliver, and will yet deliver us. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that's when he delivered us from death. So he delivered us, but he also doth deliver. He presently delivers you from things. He can deliver you from temptation in your everyday life. And he will yet deliver us. That's future. At the rapture, I'll be delivered once again. I'll have my new body and be completely redeemed. So trust in Him to deliver you. He lets you suffer because you can trust in Him. He also lets you suffer because then prayer becomes regular. Prayer becomes a lot more regular when you're suffering. 2 Corinthians 1.11 says, Y'all so helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons... Thanks may be given by many on our behalf. The Corinthians were helping together by prayer. They had the gift of helps. Anybody can have the gift of helping people by praying for them. And many people praying means many people will give thanks when the prayer gets answered. By the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So you'll notice that many times in your life you're more likely to pray when you're suffering. And the best thing to do is stay in prayer when things are going good, and then when things are going bad, you'll be already in the habit. Job was already close to God before trouble came his way. And if things are going good in your life right now, then go ahead and pray as much as you would if things were going bad. But the Lord also lets you suffer because it makes you a common man. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshy wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Paul had been through some things. He had suffered, so it knocked him down a notch or two. He was simple and sincere. He said that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, even though he was very educated and had all kinds of knowledge, he preached Christ with simplicity. It, it made him appeal to the common man. He had godly sincerity. He did things with the motive of pleasing God. Although he probably had a lot of fleshly wisdom from being a Pharisee in his unsaved life, he didn't use it when it came to certain people. He used the wisdom that he got from the Lord. And there are a lot of people that walk around stuck up with the head in their clouds, 
and they think they have all the knowledge. They think they are above everybody. They have a lot of trust in the flesh. And then the Lord lets something happen to them that puts them on their back, and it makes them a common person, makes them a more down-to-earth person. God lets you suffer here so that you'll come out better at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's the next point. God lets you suffer so you'll come out better at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 1, 13 and 14 says, For we write none other things unto you than that than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. The Corinthians acknowledged that Paul was a true apostle who led them to the Lord and they would rejoice with them at the judgment seat of Christ. And when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, the more suffering you do down here, the better rewards that you have up there. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. When you suffer for righteousness' sake down here, you're going to have an inheritance on the other side. You're going to inherit cities. Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Every time you witness for the Lord and suffer persecution, discomfort, humiliation, violence, any of that stuff for the Lord, I believe you're storing up rewards for all that suffering and an inheritance in the millennial kingdom. The Lord lets you suffer so you'll come out better at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord lets you suffer because the Christian life is more than just being saved. It's more than just getting saved and then living an easy life like Joel Osteen and all those guys say you should have. 2 Corinthians 1.15 says, And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. So Paul was going to give them a second benefit. He'd already got them saved by giving them the gospel. And he was going to follow up on his converts. He was going to show them the second most important thing. And that is the victorious Christian life. Which involves suffering. To have victory in your life, you have to suffer temptation. You have to say no to all the pleasures of this world. You have to labor in the word and in prayer. It involves suffering. 2 Corinthians 1.16 says, And to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come out again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. Paul wants to make his way to the Corinthians to preach the word to them, to reprove, rebuke, instruct in righteousness, and show them how to suffer as a Christian. He is, the, he is their apostle. He's the one that got them converted. And he wants to follow up on his converts. 2 Corinthians 1.17 says, when I, was there, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things did I, that I purposed, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? When Paul was thus minded to come to the Corinthians, he didn't use lightness. It wasn't a light thing to him. He made the decision and was determined to do it. He didn't say this in the flesh and be wishy-washy. He wasn't saying nay, nay, and yea, yea. Meaning he didn't switch back and forth and say, maybe so, I'll be there. He said, yes, I'm coming. Second Corinthians 1.18 says, But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. Just like words, God's word is sure and true, what Paul is saying is true. And he's not being wishy-washy with them. He wants to do something that many do not do today. He wants to follow up on his converts and give them a second benefit. He wants to teach them the way of the Christian life. He wants to teach them doctrine. Next, <clears throat> the Lord lets us suffer because the Savior suffered. 2 Corinthians 1.19 says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. When Jesus Christ spoke what he said was a sure thing. He wasn't wishy-washy either. He came down in the flesh and said to the disciples that he was going to die on the cross, be buried, and rise again the third day. And that's exactly what he did. He wasn't wishy-washy about it. He says, I might do it if I, if I don't chicken out or if I just feel like it that day. He knew it was a sure thing. He wasn't wishy-washy. Paul and Savannah and Timothy is, is, is the same way. And Jesus preached to thousands of Bible believers 
people who believed the scripture that they had. And he wasn't wishy-washy with what he was saying. He had the word of God that was the truth. And he knew that it was sure, just like he was sure. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, and to the glory of God by us. All the promises of God are sure. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Jesus Christ doesn't say, I might be able to keep you saved. He says, no man can pluck you out of his hand or his father's hand. The promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. Jesus is the amen. Revelation three fourteen says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus is the sinless Son of God who suffered at the hands of sinful men who should count it a joy to suffer for him. Acts 5.41 And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they counted it a joy to suffer shame for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.21 Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. If you're saved, then you're anointed. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, who, all, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know when you buy a house, you put a down payment on it and you call that earnest money? This shows you that you... This shows people that you are sure about buying the house and that you're not going to back out on the seller. It shows you're not wishy-washy. Jesus Christ is so sure about taking you to heaven with him that he gives you the earnest of the Spirit to live in you. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 1.13-14 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, and to the redemption of the purchased possession, and to the praise of his glory. If you realize that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, then it's going to help you in your Christian life. In 2 Corinthians 1.23, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet into Corinth. So he hadn't came yet because he was waiting on them to get some things fixed first. And then he says, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. So they're standing by faith. And Paul wants to come and give them a second benefit. He wants to be a helper of their joy. He not only wanted them to lead them to the Lord, but he wants to come back and help them and teach them the right doctrine so they're not deceived. And you see, this was a carnal baby church, the Corinthians. They were baby Christians, and Paul knew that they needed someone to lead them and guide them. And he needed to address this about Christian suffering because many times a baby Christian will experience some suffering and then give up. But remember, all the benefits that come along with suffering, even though they may not happen right away, you're going to reap the benefits of suffering faithfully.